going to start on the private pilot oral. I'm going off this uh, pronounce that I've got made up. Um, you can find it on girlsinflight.org under tips. Okay, the first thing we talk about is certificates of documents. What do I, what do you as a private pilot need? You need your pilot certificate. Okay, so if you're a student pilot, you've got to have your pilot certificate. If you're a private pilot, you'll have that certificate. Um, whatever level you have, but you've got to have your pilot certificate on your person. You're also required to have a photo ID, the SAMS card. Okay, they quit putting the pictures on them, so, but that didn't work. Okay, it needs to be a government-issued photo ID. If you're a college student, you got a college campus ID, yeah, not quite good enough. We need to be a driver's license, passport, military ID, something along those lines. Uh, then you need your medical certificate, okay? So it doesn't matter whether it's a third class or a first class or a basic med. Uh, if you if you got a, a normal medical, you'll have a copy of it. If you've got basic med, there are special rules. You still have to have like the copy of it, and then you've got to have the rules along with that. So if you're walking around with basic med, you've got to carry more paperwork than someone with a normal. Uh, and just for what it's worth. When you file on that basic med, the FAA has that information. They can access it. Okay, uh, had a gentleman uh, in a nearby airport that was going to give rides. Uh, a friend of mine was a flight instructor. He knew that the guy had approached him about doing his flight review, and my friend refused to give him a flight review for personal reasons. Anyway, this guy's going to give kids a ride, and it's kind of like, well, I'm pretty sure his flight review is expired. And then he looks online and the guy's kind of like, no medical. The guy's like, well, I've got basic med. So my friend asked to see the copy of the basic med. Okay, he doesn't, I left it at home. I'm not required to carry it. Huh, you know, somebody may or may not have called the FAA. Uh, <laughs> and, but you know, but the, but the FAA looked and he didn't have a uh, basic med. Bottom line was my friend flew those kids. So the kids got to fly. The guy who was offering the rides didn't get to fly the kids, so no violation occurred. Um, but, but nothing bad happened either. So, uh, when does your medical expire? Okay. Can I ask you a yeah. question? Am I required to carry my logbook for any reason, particularly like for an endorsement? As a student pilot, when you're going across country, thou shalt have your logbook with you. Okay. And once you're a private pilot, uh, leave it at home is my recommendation. Uh, if you have it with you and something happens, then the FAA can say, oh, let me look at your logbook. Okay, if you have it at home in the safe where it should be, it can't get lost. And now you're kind of like, I got 10 days to produce it. Okay, so that means I can make sure that everything is up to um, uh, as it should be. Okay, so if you're if you had your flight review endorsement from the instructor, but I gave it to you on a sticky note, and you didn't actually stick it in the logbook, it's done, you're legal, but it's like saying, you know, we don't want a technicality to cause us grief. Okay, so when does your medical expire? Always at the end of the month, but um, two years or five years, depending on your age. Okay, uh, if you're 39 and a half and you're only using the third class privileges go ahead and get your third class because it's still good for five years if you're flying professionally when that one goes away it's still going to be uh, a new one is going to trump the old one so you can't like well I get one right before that and I can use it for five years even no you can't play those games um, okay uh, privileges and limitations of a private pilot can you be compensated for a flight? Ah, uh, if it's incidental to the business, okay, so uh, Lavina works for a company that uh, does oil field supplies. Okay, if they ask her to deliver an oil pump to a town 200 miles away, she already works for them and it's kind of like she's not a pilot for them, uh, we can sort of do that. If they just call her out of the blue and says, hey, can you do this because we know you have an airplane? No, that becomes a no. Um, you can, you have to do your fair share. 
So if you're going to take a flight, you're, all, you're a licensed pilot, and if you take me with you, we each have to pay half, or you have to pay at least half. If we've got room for four people in there, it's kind of like now I have to pay a quarter. <laughs> so, but on the other hand, you don't want to use that to overload the airplane, make bad decisions. So pro rata means you have to pay uh, your fair share of the flight expenses. So the tie downs, the fuel, the lease of the airplane, those kinds of things. They're not gonna, they don't get too deep into hotel rooms and meals and all that, but they understanding building time is considered compensation. Okay, if you're not sure if it's legal, then just don't go there. Easy enough. If you're not certain that it's a, that it fits that, and then the nonprofit kind of a thing. So if I'm flying Boy Scouts or Young Eagles or something along those lines, now uh, they may pay a small fee for that flight, but you're not getting paid, even though you are building time and it's considered a level of compensation, but that is legal. And again, you better make sure that you're current, proficient, comfortable, uh, all of those kinds of things. Um, kind of get into currency versus proficiency. I kind of mentioned this yesterday with whoever. Um, but it's been six months since you've done any night landings. All right, we're definitely not current. So we're getting ready to go. So we go out, we catch some dark, and we go out and we do our first landing, and you're like, but nobody saw that one happen. <laughs> and so we come back around and we do it again, and you're like, yep, still not happy. And then I go and do a third one, and I'm like, I'm fixing to kill myself. Are you current? Yes. You've survived three takeoff and landings at night to a full stop. Do you really want to put your kids in there with you? Come on. Okay. Uh, you're not proficient. Okay. Now, I've been flying for a bunch of years. I go out there and I do one good landing at night. Am I proficient? Maybe. Probably. Am I current? No. So I have to, you know, it's kind of like the regulation uh, dictates the currency. It's kind of up to me to validate the proficiency. Okay, if I'm in doubt, I can go fly with somebody else. Um, you mentioned endorse endorsements. You, you um, asked a student preparing for an exam recently, what happens if you aren't night current and you take a flight with a passenger and you land up at up to or Fort Meacham and all of a sudden it's becoming dusk what are you going to do in that situation or what could you do to yeah. mitigate and you know another one is kind of like okay we'll take Justin here he's going to Colorado they were planning on leaving at 10 a.m. and get there well before dark okay yes life gets in the way they didn't get to leave till 4 p.m. it's going to be well after dark before they get there does he wait till it gets dark and then load his family in the airplane and take off into the darkness? Or maybe he goes as far as he can till it's, uh, well, it's still daylight and land, wait till it gets full on dark, go out and do your three takeoff and landings. If you don't like them, you go to a hotel. <laughs> if you, you know, if they are sufficient, if you feel proficient, now you can come on, you know, then you can load them back up and continue on to your destination. So there's more than one way to do this. But if you're planning a trip, just go get night current a few days in advance and you don't have to worry about this because again, if he goes up there thinking, oh, I just need to go do my three takeoff and landings and they're ugly, bite the bullet and pay for a hotel room because it's a smart thing to do. Does it mean we miss a day of skiing? Yep, uh, you know, so understanding, we make smart choices. Uh, transitioning for endorsements to get high performance. This is more than 200 horsepower. Okay, so 200 horsepower doesn't quite cut it. I need 201. Okay, so I need a, you know, whatever that engine is, a 182, but I have to have the endorsement for the high power. Okay, uh, conventional gear, it's a tailwheel airplane. I need a tailwheel endorsement. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm so old I was grandfathered in. <laughs> but uh, they call it conventional because that was that's what we started with. 
Okay, but you do need that tailwheel endorsement. Uh, if you're flying a complex airplane, one where the wheels go up and down, we need an endorsement for each one of those. Okay, those are going to be in my log book. Uh, and then the insurance company gets involved and they want X number of hours and make and model. Again, the FAA doesn't go there. So we need to be proficient and current, but we also need to meet the FAA requirements. And then we need to know what the insurance limitations are on that particular airplane, that particular policy, because that can reach up and bite us in some ways we don't even want to go to. Documents on the airplane. Airplane has to have an airworthiness certificate. The airworthiness certificate is issued when the airplane is born. Okay, think of it as a birth certificate. It can be changed. Okay, so if I don't like the end number that's on there, I want my own personal end number. I can get a new end number issued and have the airplane repainted, and then I'm going to get a new uh, airworthiness certificate that re reflects that new end number. Okay, that's about the only, you know, those are the only kind of things that I get there. I also need a registration. Registration's now good for three years. Okay, so if my registration expired on the last day of last month, my airplane's not legal to fly. Really, it's just a piece of paper. Okay, it's still not legal to fly. And if both those documents aren't in the airplane, the airplane's not legal to fly. So legal versus whatever. So that registration uh, has to be done every three years. Operating limitations, okay. Some of our older airplanes, those operating limitations are just placards on the panel. Don't slip with full flaps or whatever kind of things that we have on there. The airspeed limitations that are on the airspeed indicator, those are our operating limitations. Uh, my newer airplanes, I think 1981, but I'm not swear to that. But anyway, and you're like, that's new? <laughs> but uh, after a certain date, every airplane has its own uh, POH, pi uh, Pilot Operating Handbook, that is specific to that airplane, in number specific. So if I've got one on my 172, I can't use it for somebody else's 172. It has to be specific to that airplane. And again, if I have additional STC, stole kits, whatever, then that kind of goes in there. Um, when I'm flying the airplane, I've got to have my current weight and balance data. I need to know what the airplane weighed at the last uh, time it was verified. So every time I make an avionics change, they pull a radio out, put a new one in, and they tell me, okay, it gained two pounds or lost two pounds or what have you, but it didn't, but it was in the same location. Uh, if it's something else, I need to know what those are. Okay, so I look at my weight and balance. If I'm going across country, I need maps. Um, and then we'll, we'll go on and next one, we'll talk about the inspections and what's involved in those inspections.